here with three friends up somewhere in the mid mid north part of the Hudson Valley, Stella Metcalf. Hi, Stella. How are you? I'm good. How are you? And Emma Otten, whom I know from another world. Hey, Emma. Not <laughs> another world like yeah. beyond Earth, but and Stephen Metcalf. Steve. Hi. How hey. are you? Very good. How are you? I'm excited to talk to the three of you about a Robert Frost poem, a very short one called Of a Winter Evening. It's actually not a very well-known poem. Um, Stella, would you read it? And then we'll just talk about it for a few minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, of a Winter Evening by Robert Frost. The winter owl banked just in time to pass and save herself from breaking window glass. And her wide wings strained suddenly at spread caught color from the last of evening red in a display of under down and quill to glassed in children at the windowsill. So Emma, what's like literally the story? Um, this owl is almost doing what? He almost like crashes into a window where children are behind it and sounds like inside a house. Yeah. Um, and it's like, he stops just in time, just yeah. before crashing into the window. Literally. <laughs> yeah, literally, it's a, sto it's a story. Um, Stella, what does Frost, does the speaker really expect us to think that an owl might not bank in time? I mean, can an owl break into, a, run into a window? I suppose so. Yeah, definitely. As you're reading this, do you think it is possible, that disaster? Yeah, definitely. I think that the, um, it's building up something maybe. Do you think, Stella, I mean, Frost sometimes is just telling you something observed. The, the often, as Steve no doubt will note in the next few minutes, the, he's fascinated by the intersection between nature just doing its thing and human beings trying to observe nature. And, and the window is literally the, the transparency machine that protects humans from nature, I mean, it's, and it's also possibly a metaphor for poetry itself, but that's going too far. Um, the window is the thing that separates the kids, and yet, Stella, the, the kids probably shouldn't be sitting at the, I mean, are they scared? Is there fear? And if it's fear, what is it countered by? Is there something other than fear that the kids might experience? What do you there's, think? I think there's fear and maybe awe, like, at this like site and like they see the um, the evening red, like they see the light behind it, hitting it. Mm. It's a time of day, right, Emma? What time yeah. of day? Um, it's probably around sunset. Yeah, right, right, exactly. So Steve, um, glassed in children's a very, like it's a, it's a phrase that has all kinds of bells and alarms next to it, right? Glassed in children. I what does it mean? Uh, well, glass, you know, makes two appearances. In the first appearance, it's potentially almost broken by the owl, at least in the imagination of the poet. You know, whether the owl was ever going to hit the window, we don't really know. But, right. uh, but you know, uh, in the hypothesis of the poem, the owl, uh, the owl was on its way to, to doing that. And then um, my cat is about to walk across the oh. room. That's so frosty and so it's about to the glass is about to break at the top of the poem and by the bottom of the poem it's a it's a instrument of containment. The children are glassed in, almost like they're in an aquarium or something. Yeah. So Emma and Stella, each of you, the word display is very dramatic, right? A display of underdown and quill. I mean, mm. Frost could have used some other words. Um, well, demonstration, but that's still display. Uh, he could have not used display. Anyway, what does display signify for either of you or both of you? Emma, you first. Um, it kind of reminds me of something like maybe the it maybe to the children like the owl, um, like raising her wings out wide. Um, that's kind of like a performance. Yeah. Um, and display is like, it, that's like something you would like see or observe. And that's like what the right. children are doing from behind the glass. Right. Stella, is there a chance that this owl is aware that she is performing? I mean, a display of underdown and quill. It's like, 
it's almost as if the owl is saying, it's sunset, I'm a winter owl, the kids are in the window, I'm going to give them something to remember. There's almost a kind of, taunting's not the right word, but like, I'm an owl, you want me to do my owl thing? What do you think about that? Yeah, there is a showy aspect to it. Like, um, I think, like, the description of the owl is like, like the, the, help me. <laughs> jump, jump in. Jump in, dad. Uh, it's play has got a, an element of performance and ostentation to it, which Frost himself was aware that he possessed as a poet. So the word quill is an interesting one. Yes, quill. I mean, boy, oh boy, you know, Stella and Emma, when we see quill, we make a living bullshitting about poetry. <laughs> um, we see Quill, we think of what we call meta poetry. Uh, Frost is clearly thinking about the pen he's using to write this poem. He may have been typewriting it, but Quill works really well to signify the fact that he is performing as well. Right? So it's almost like Frost. I would not have liked to have been the Frost children. <laughs> no, no, definitely not, at all. not like sweet dad, like Steve. Um, th he's he's doing that kind of scary, thrilly thing for the kids. I'm going to do something that you'll never forget. Dad, you scared the shit out of us. Don't do that, right? There's just something. Now, Emma and Stella, you're you know adults, but still, just go back into your kids at window moment, right? Tell us about your own, your own sense of what it's like to be a child at a window. What are you doing? You've done it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Being a child at a window is like, you're kind of like on display yourself to anything outside of the window. So you can kind of like picture maybe the owl like watching the children at the same time the children are watching the owl. So you can't like really tell who's like who's performing for who in that like yes. could be a like... I don't know, parallel between the two. Um, oh, brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Stella, go from there. So kids at windows, Emma's saying there's a double looking. Kids at windows are protected by the window, although here it's almost not a protection enough, right? They're at a window, they're looking out, and it turns out that nature is looking at them. There's a recipro uh, reciprocity here. Um, there, but there's something so special about children at windows. When, did, did you ever go, you lived north enough so that sometimes when, before you went off to Emma Willard, you, you had, must have gone to school locally. And you, when it was snowing, you were hoping school would get canceled. Did you ever press your nose against the window looking at the snow? Tell us about that. What did that feel like and what was that about? Why do kids go to the window? Well, I think window, there's a sense of like opportunity and like so imagination, imagination at what like is beyond the window and it's like mm. there's an element of like untouchableness and it's also like it's kind of like self-centered almost because it's like in the poem it's like both of the characters think that they're the character you know what i mean oh, yeah. like i feel like the owl thinks that the owl is the main focus and the <laughs> children think that the children are the main focus oh you're but. so right oh my gosh steve what do you do with this the uh speaker is clearly uh, big ego, but is like st pretending to be standing aside to let the owl and the kids duke it out. Sure. What do you have to say about the speaker? Well, the funny thing about, about Frost is that he labored so hard to make it seem as though everything he wrote was conversational or not, not really a remarkable performance. At the same time, he wanted so badly for people to notice what a rhetorical performance it was. Right. right. You know, the, the poem is, you know, it's, it's sort of per perfectly metrical. It's wonderfully rhymed. It's, it's a formal gem. You know, it's cut like a little formal gem, yeah. but it rolls off, you know, very easily as a, as a performance in a way. Um, and... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I assume that Frost is, I place Frost's sympathies with the owl and his, <laughs> his sense of, you know, you know, the naturalness of a bird flying, you know, yeah. 
combined with the self-conscious flourish of a bird showing off in front of a window. It certainly is the classic tension in Frost, which is Frost is thinking, what are you people doing in there? All the good, good uh, vital, basic, fundamental stuff is happening out here. And or or glassing yourself in, you need a bit. You need a bit of a scare. Well, right. Or in the danger of glass being being broken, it's 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 the it's the you know it's the membrane between the two, you know, between nature and culture. And dare you break it? Yeah. You know, or That's not. Right. Yeah. The que- there's the whole question of throwing stones at people who live in glass houses. Well, you know, I think Frost is kind of into that. It's, he's not going to throw a stone. He's not that kind of poet. He'll throw an owl. <laughs> um, right, too, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Emma and Stella and Steve I'd love a final thought from each of you about the poem or in the case of Emma and Stella what's it like to be given 10 minutes notice to uh, go on the air uh, who knows who's going to watch us to talk about this you know and you probably have some lack of confidence just by just by virtue of your age some lack of confidence that what you say about a poem Um, might not be good enough. I mean, but it wasn't hard. And in fact, you both excelled. So maybe you want to say something about what it was like to have this conversation. In any case, uh, Emma, you first, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Um, I wasn't expecting to be analyzing a poem this afternoon, but um, I think just like getting to like, I mean, school's over. We're not really like looking at poems anymore. And just like, (laughs) But you are. Like, like this little, I don't know, maybe like reality check, like, oh, you're still going to have to do this next year. <laughs> like, like um, just an, like using your brain, like realizing that like, like this stuff is important to just recognize and like really looking at like the artistry, like through the poem is. Yeah. Look at. Yeah. I mean, if we had more time, we would t- go back to you again and have you talk about what's going on in the brain when you're doing something like this, which is, shall we say, not required, but. It's too much fun to avoid if you have a vital uh, mind like you do. Um, Stella, what's your final thought? I think it really pulls you out of your like own ego almost like because you don't have the time to like delve into it and really like make something up. You just kind of have to like go mm. with what you see and there's something like kind of powerful in that. I don't know. There's nothing better. That is what it's all about. That's what you know, the best college or university can uh, model for you, but also what we're trying to prove through this YouTube series is that, um, not that you guys are randomly chosen, you're very special, but you know, you can, I I believe in the power of people to, especially something focused like this, to be able to talk really interestingly about almost anything, if you create enough of a structure. And as you say, it's gotta be improvised because you can't prepare all these things. And Steve Metcalf, who's, you know, whose specialty is winging it, as it were. This, is kind of, <laughs> this poem is kind of winging it. I can hear Naomi laughing through the muted Zoom. Oh, <laughs> we're referring to a dear friend of yours, Naomi Mezzi, who joined us for a previous episode. Steve, final thought? Uh, this may be the poem that inspired the opening of the poem in Pale, Pale Fire. Fire. I was the shadow of the wax wing slain. Nabokov. There's a lot of evidence that Nabokov encountered this poem in, I think, the Saturday Evening Post or mm. right before or right as he was composing the mm. opening parts of Pale Fire. And I've always thought that connection was very provocative. My final thought has to do with the Glaston children. Uh, we're, we're recording this in what most people think is the middle of a pandemic. Some people think the beginning of the end of a pandemic. Nonetheless, there's a lot of children who've been glassed in for a long time, for months. And I don't know, this poem resonates well, better now, because there's a lot of people looking, looking out from the window and they're wondering what kind of exciting display of wild naturalness could get them excited after all this all the dull, the dull stuff that we've been made to do inside. And that is a pandemic over reading and it will conclude our episode of Modpo Minute. Stella Metcalf, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. And Emma Otten, good to see you. You too. And Steve Metcalf, as always, thank you.
Total pleasure. And, and a cameo from my cat and my dog. So, <laughs> the name of the, I didn't see the dog, but the cat's name? Sasha. Sasha. And have you done a lot of Zoom sessions where Sasha makes a special cameo appearance? I think it must be around 4.30 in the afternoon because it's right around dinner time that the, the wander across the keyboard. That's so funny. They really know what they're doing. Yeah. They do. yeah. Well, thank you all. All right. Thanks, Al. If you liked this episode, watch another and subscribe. And join us for ModPo, a free and open course at modpo.org.